And today, the Des Moines Police Department lays to rest one of their own. They do. You're looking live right now at uh, Lutheran Church of Hope in West Des Moines as funeral services for 38-year-old Sergeant Anthony David Biminio are about to get underway. Now, it was just five weeks ago, the early morning hours of Wednesday, November 2nd, that Sergeant Biminio and Urbandale Police Officer Justin Martin were brutally gunned down while they were simply sitting in their squad cars. They were shot ambush style while they were on patrol. Funeral services for Officer Martin are scheduled for tomorrow in his hometown of Rockwell City. KCCI will provide live coverage from Rockwell City as well. And we do begin our special coverage of funeral services for Des Moines Police Sergeant Anthony Bominio. That's right. His funeral service, as we said, being held at Lutheran Church of Hope in West Des Moines. Pastors Mike Householder and Jeremy Johnson are officiating the service. Following the funeral, burial will take place at Glendale Cemetery in Des Moines. KCCI's Molly Cooney and Alex Sachs join us now from Lutheran Church of Hope in West Des Moines. Molly? Good morning to both of you. Alex and I have been out here for several hours. The grief continues today and words cannot describe what friends and family members are going through today. We talked with Sergeant Paul Parizic just a little bit ago and uh, the outpouring of support literally is coming from both coasts and everywhere in between from New York State, New Hampshire, Utah, Texas, and as you can imagine, I think it's probably who is not here today, especially from here in Iowa, Border Patrol, and countless local um, administrations and police departments from all over Iowa. Thousands of people have packed the church uh, coming in all throughout the morning. They started showing up very early. The service is set to begin at 11, mm -hmm. so we, that is getting ready to be underway. Dana Wingert will have the eulogy today. We'll also hear from Simon Estes. He'll be singing the Lord's Prayer. And then finally, it will end with the final 1042. That will signal the end of Sergeant Bimenio's watch. That will be read from a Des Moines Police Department dispatcher. And then the procession. There's about a thousand police that will be a part of that procession, hundreds of vehicles. Let's go ahead and go through that route for you. It's gonna go from the church, north on Jordan Creek Parkway, then east on I-80 to I-235, and then from there taking the 63rd Street exit north to University, ending to Sergeant Bimenio's final resting place at Glendale Cemetery. Earlier today, we were here when his family arrived, and uh, the sergeant is survived by his wife, Zoe, and their three children, Cameron, Haley, and Maddox, and also his parents and his sister, Krista Benigno, and they are all here. Um, but again, Captain Wingert is going to be doing the eulogy, and um, there will be prayers. Also, um, we don't know who else will be speaking, but we understand. I don't think any of the family members will be. Yeah, they have not shown up on mm -hmm. a list. It's, it, mm -hmm. it is an emotional time. And one thing that we notice on the police officers, a lot of them wearing their badge mm -hmm. with that stripe over it. Yeah. And they're, it's, they're wearing Sergeant Bimineo's badge number 5030. Uh, just a powerful sentiment seeing that. And, and I think it's powerful for the entire family during this tough time, yeah. seeing the outpour of community support. We're expecting lots and lots of Iowans to be along that route. And interestingly, the public has been invited to attend the services today, and uh, we do see a few more stragglers coming in, but, um, and they are also uh, going to be bused from here to Glendale Cemetery because they're encouraging public cannot park at Glendale Cemetery too. So if you're planning on going, you can line the procession. Um, but as far as the, you know, Glendale, you cannot park any private cars there. So a lot of buses are taking the public and some of the officers from there, but a lot will be in the procession too. And if you've seen it before, the words cannot describe the emotions and the feelings once you see that line of cars go by. And what we're seeing with those cars, that blue stripe of mm -hmm, tape, mm -hmm. seeing that a lot, seeing the American flag flown on cars. Yeah. We also know that Sergeant Bimenio liked to ride his Harley Davidson. There's mm -hmm. been several right, motorcyclists several. that have been pulling into the parking lot. They have their got the American flag flying and also sporting that blue. That has been also overwhelming. But again, it's that silver lining of support and strength and love through this tragedy. And this is the uh, um, program that is going to be handed out to everybody. Um, end of final watch. And when you hear that call, yeah. again, no words can describe. Even if you didn't know the sergeant, and he touched many lives. 
He was a school resource officer at both Roosevelt and East. He had high praise from all the students who knew him and lives that he touched. And his children, we can't even begin to imagine what they're going through. But again, the community support and what um, Sergeant Parisic said last week, his family, Bimineo's family, was concerned about how the police were doing. It wasn't how they were doing. They were like, but how are you doing? And I think that is just the outpouring of care and concern on every level has really helped the entire community get through this. And this is Iowa. So mm -hmm. as the Bimineo family is taking care of law enforcement, mm -hmm. Sergeant Paul Parizek brought us all out water this morning, yeah. making sure we were OK. Mm -hmm. I've seen him do that several times throughout the, the last week or so. And it's mm -hmm. that's another example of just this community stepping up and being right. there for one another, whether you wear the badge or you don't, whether you're a family member or a friend. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Sergeant Bimineo's children. He mm -hmm. really enjoyed watching them play sports. sports he was exactly. a huge. Uh, Cardinals fan and a huge mm -hmm. Hawkeye fan. You can see that on the program because yes, that yes. was so much a part yes. of who he Some was. Pictures, yeah. And as they remember him today, they're remembering all of those qualities and the things he loved. Right. He grew up in Fort Dodge, but he uh, went to school in Iowa City. He was a big wrestler and a big football fan. You can tell by his stature. You can. But I think um, he, uh, Joe Gonzalez had said he was a big teddy bear, too. So um, for those of us who were not um, able to meet him, um, we feel like we know him. No, oh, don't we? Absolutely. So this whole community does. But once again, we are here at Lutheran Church of Hope, and let's um, throw it back to the studio. And as far as the services, we will be here afterwards. And again, we will follow pr the procession. We will be carrying this live, the entire process, the entire services, and all the way to Glendale Cemetery. Back to you, Stephen Stacy. Molly and Alex, and as Molly just said, yes, we will be uh, have continuing live coverage both on air and online on kcci.com so uh, we know that a lot of people want to view this and uh, we are happy to provide these services uh, uh, the funeral coverage as you can see the casket is being rolled into Lutheran Church of Hope right now being led by a contingent of Des Moines police officers and um, you can hear the bagpipes in the background uh, let's just listen in for a few moments
I read a note my grandma wrote back in 1923. Grandpa kept it in his coat and he showed it once to me. He said, boy, you might not understand, but a long, long time ago, grandma's daddy didn't like me none, but I loved your grandma so. We had this crazy plan to meet and run away together, get married. I found this letter And this is what it said If you get there before I do Don't give up on me I'll meet you when my chores are through I don't know how long I'll be But I'm not gonna let you And between now and then, till I see you again, I'll be loving you. Love me. I read those words just hours before my grandma passed away in the doorway. Where me and Grandpa stopped to pray I know I'd never seen him cry In all my 15 years But as he said these words to her His eyes filled up with tears If you get there before I do I'll meet you when my chores are through I don't know how long I'll be But I'm not gonna let you down Darling, wait and see And between now and then Until I see you again I'll be loving you Love You are looking live at uh, the funeral service for Des Moines Police Sergeant Anthony Bimenio. This is going on right now at Lutheran Church of Hope in West Des Moines. Still, the Des Moines police officers, any of them who uh, wanted to attend this service, uh, they were able to do so today. And as you can see, looks like the entire force is there paying tribute to their fellow far fallen officer. I do uh, need to let you know that police officers from surrounding communities and uh, even uh, Polk County and maybe in some cases state officers are helping watch the city of Des Moines while their service is going on. And it's kind of interesting, Stacy, to uh, watch the demeanor of these men and women as they pass that casket. Um, normal 
funerals are not like a police funeral. Um, the faces uh, seem to be a little bit more stone-faced, uh, maybe in some cases a little bit more ashen, shoulders slumped a little bit, maybe because each of these officers know, but for the grace of God, there go I. It, it is a very powerful thing to watch happen. Uh, we had to see it earlier this year as well. This is not the first line of duty death for the Des Moines Police Department. Earlier this year, there were two other funerals for Officer Susan Farrell and Officer Carlos Puente Morales. And we saw this same mute, moving tribute to those officers and to their families as well at that time. We expect uh, a, a thousand officers mm -hmm. from uh, and law enforcement officers from all across the country, um, east coast and west coast, north and south, to come and pay their respects to the family of Sergeant Biminio and also to his brothers and sisters in blue here in Des Moines. And uh, we do see some of those police officers from other uh, communities, states, uh, passing the, uh, the casket. This is still the uh, Des Moines Police Department, uh, their officers right here, but uh, we saw some folks in other uniforms moving through. And uh, you mentioned the support of uh, other law enforcement uh, agencies, also the support here in the city of Des Moines, city of Urbandale, the entire metro area from the public has been fantastic from the, uh, the prayer services to the memorial set up both at the Urbandale Police uh, Department and at the Des Moines Police Department and the placing of the, uh, the blue line of tape on the back windows of people's cars as I was driving around this weekend saw uh, many, many cars with the thin blue line because that is the difference between uh, the good guys really and the bad guys in this world is a thin blue line and these men and women uh, who you see today, they represent that. The memorials at the uh, Urbandale Police Department and the Des Moines Police Department had grown overwhelmingly throughout the weekend to the point where you could no longer see the cruisers mm -hmm. that uh, were under the piles of flowers and cards and notes and mementos and balloons that people from all across the state were bringing in to, uh, to let the uh, police officers and, and the uh, families of these officers know that uh, they are appreciated and respected and uh, the public mourns in this loss and shares for certain in this heartbreak. Yeah, it was interesting. It was, uh, I was out in Urbandale on Wednesday night and I knew you were in Des Moines on Thursday night uh, during our five, six, nine and 10 o'clock newscast. Um, the generosity of people uh, it was just amazing. People were bringing by food, business owners. They had so much food in Urbandale that uh, they were calling for additional refrigerator space and they were telling all the media and uh, you know, it just happened that there were going to be some political events in the city of Des Moines that day that were all put on hold because of this terrible, terrible tragedy here in the greater Des Moines area. And uh, all of those folks from the different networks across the country were uh, in town and they covered this story instead of the political events and uh, the police department giving everybody hugs and offering everybody food because they had so much. And we continue to see the procession of law enforcement officers come through and pay their respects to the uh, family of Sergeant Bominio and as they pass his casket at the front of the sanctuary, they are saluting in honor of him and in respect of him. We can read from his uh, obituary now, just a few pieces here. Anthony David Bominio was born November 21st, 1977 in Fort Dodge to Frank and Patricia Sweeney Bominio. Tony grew up in Iowa City. He attended Iowa City West, where he excelled in football and wrestling. And following graduation, Tony continued his education and athletic career, which ended at Simpson College, earning a bachelor's degree in criminal justice, and later the University of Cincinnati, where he earned his master's of science degree. 
Now, Tony began his law enforcement career in 2001 when he took the oath to protect and serve with the Indian Indianola Police Department. In 2005, Tony transferred to Des Moines and was currently serving as one of the Des Moines Police Department's finest. He took a leadership role when he achieved the rank of sergeant. Tony also served in many areas of the department, including the Metro Star team. Tony was a humble man who was honored and dedicated to protect and serve the community. He also spent time as a school resource officer at local schools. In fact, uh, my older daughter attended Des Moines Roosevelt, and uh, Tony Bimenio was the school resource officer at Des Moines Roosevelt High her freshman and sophomore years. And uh, she was brought to tears when uh, she heard that his life had been taken. Uh, because he was so highly regarded at that school and she said she witnessed a number of occasions where uh, this man probably could have been a little bit rougher with kids uh, than he was but he felt his job was to educate these kids and set them on the right path instead of uh, maybe getting them in uh, more trouble that would just create more problems for them along the line. So he was loved and respected by uh, the kids at Des Moines Roosevelt High School. I understand he was at Des Moines East before that and he was certainly loved and respected by his brothers and sisters in blue as we're seeing today. And Tony was also a devoted husband to his wife Zoe, a wonderful father to his three children Cameron, Haley, and Maddox. He was an avid St. Louis Cardinals and Iowa Hawkeyes fan and enjoyed deer hunting and riding his Harley Davidson. Most of all, Tony treasured time spent with Zoe and attending his children's athletic events and being together as a family. You see in the, uh, on the screen here the uh, fire department raising the uh, American flag outside of the Lutheran Church of Hope where today's ceremony is being held. The procession will proceed under that flag arch following the, uh, the ceremony here. And if um, you're just tuning in and you're wondering what's going on, these are officers from all across the state, all across the country, who have come to uh, the Greater Des Moines area to pay their respects to Officer, officer excuse me, Sergeant Anthony Bominio, who was killed last Wednesday in a brutal ambush-style attack on the streets of Des Moines and uh, these folks are here as you can see to walk by his casket give one last salute and pay their respects to a fellow officer in blue now the Des Moines officers this is uh, really interesting there are anybody who needed child care could uh, drop off their children at a location in Grimes and they would be watched by uh, fellow officers and uh, their spouses so that uh, anybody in the greater Des Moines area who wanted to uh, make it to the service out at Lutheran Church of Hope in West Des Moines could do so without uh, fear that their, child, their children had, would not be cared for. So, um, you know, the law enforcement community here in Central Iowa just uh, coming to the aid of everyone to make sure that this officer is paid the proper respect. Sergeant Bominio worked the overnight shift and in order for many of his colleagues on that same shift to attend today's services, officers from other shifts and from other areas would come in and have offered to come in and fill in those roles so that his shift mates, the men and women he worked with on that overnight shift could come and attend today's service. We expect to see hundreds of law enforcement officers file past this casket, paying their respects this morning. And we expect hundreds more um, cruisers out on the streets as part of the uh, procession from the uh, funeral service to the burial site at Glendale Cemetery in Des Moines, coming from all across the country to pay their respects to Sergeant Bominio pay their respects to the Des Moines Police Department and of course Sergeant Bominio's wife and three children. And uh, as you can tell it's very very quiet 
in that church this morning. The only thing you can hear is uh, the shuffling of feet every now and then. Now, when we started uh, our coverage this morning, you could see the number of empty seats there, which really gave you uh, a good idea of just how many members of the public and police officers from around the country they were expecting to uh, have at Lutheran Church of Hope, and uh, it was a sea of empty seats. Um, as uh, Molly Cooney and Alex Sachs uh, told us, uh, earlier that uh, the Babinio family has opened this up to the public. Um, they are inviting the public to attend all of the events now um, because Glendale Cemetery on the west side of Des Moines basically at 56th and University is um, rather difficult to uh, get a whole lot of cars into and out of. Um, anybody who comes to the service will be bussed over to the cemetery for the actual burial services today. And one thing we have seen throughout this week is an outpouring of community support. You know, we talked about the memorials that were ever growing outside the Des Moines Police Department and the Urbandale Police Department over the uh, past several days. And uh, at one point, um, Des Moines Police Chief Dana Wingert came out of the uh, police station with a handful of cards and pictures and notes in his hands. And uh, he said that those had all come in from school children all across the metro. Others were coming in from across the state. Teachers had told the children as best they could, explained to them what had happened. And they all felt compelled to write cards of thanks and support and prayers and uh, when you see those kinds of things coming from school children, it's just very, very touching. Yeah, it really tugs at your heartstrings. And honestly, as you sit here and you watch something like this, as, as I said last week, um, we in the media work very close, closely with uh, police officers and um, spend a lot of time with them at different points in our career. And many of them come to be uh, our friends and um, just watching this having worked in the Des Moines television market for 30 plus years um, do have some chills running up and down my spine I do have uh, some goosebumps um, simply because I know so many of the people there to not have the pleasure of knowing Officer Bimenio personally but um, I know how some of my friends in the Des Moines Police Department, how deeply they're grieving uh, his passing. And it is impressive. You see um, all the different uniforms, different hats, different badges. They're not uniforms we see around here. And the reason they're here is to pay respect to a brother they never knew, to an officer they never served alongside, but they feel it is a part of their duty to be here to make sure that uh, the man who wore badge number 5030 in the city of Des Moines for the last 11 years is paid proper respect.
This has been a difficult year for the Des Moines Police Department. This is the third officer funeral line of duty death that uh, the department has had this year. Earlier this year, Officer Carlos Puente Morales and Officer Susan Farrell were killed in the line of duty when their vehicle was hit by a wrong way driver on Interstate 80. We saw a similar procession during those funerals as we are today. Law enforcement officers from across the country coming to pay their respects. And as Steve said, in many cases, it's um, the officers here to pay their respects and to honor the fallen didn't know the officer who died. But they do see it's very important to support one another all across the country. Hundreds of officers will fill this space today. We expect to see hundreds more patrol cars, patrol units out on the street in, as part of the procession from the funeral site, which is the Lutheran Church of Hope, to the uh, Glendale Cemetery in Des Moines. And you get an idea of just how, uh, over the past five days, we've got an idea of just how difficult this is for the Des Moines Police Department. I mean, these are people who are trained to separate their emotions from the work at hand. And uh, when you say, when you see big tough guys like Chief Dana Wengert, um, tough guy like uh, Public Information Officer Paul Parizic, and uh, they're crestfallen and uh, their voices are cracking and uh, their hands are shaking. You know just what a big, important deal this is and the impact that it's having on the, the Des Moines Police Department and those of the, uh, the well, as we can see today, all across the country. Last Wednesday morning, two Metro Police officers were shot in ambush-style attacks. The first shooting happened at 1.06 a.m. at 70th and Aurora. That's where Urbandale Police Officer Justin Martin was killed. The second shooting happened 20 minutes later at Merle Hay and Sheridan, right across uh, from Des Moines First Church. And that's where Des Moines Sergeant Mominio was shot. He was taken to Iowa Methodist Medical Center where he later died. And Stacy, it looks like the uh, procession of officers may be complete at this point. Oh, looks like another, oh, this is uh, another group of Des Moines officers here. This must be the Des Moines Honor Guard, the uh, the white utility belts and holsters, white gloves. You can only imagine how difficult it is for uh, those officers who have served over the last 11 years with Officer Bimineo. Once again, funeral service taking place at Lutheran Church of Hope in West Des Moines. Looks like everyone is finding their seats and the funeral service should be starting shortly. Okay. The uh, greeting and opening prayer will be provided by Lutheran Church of Hope Pastor Jeremy Johnson.
You could hear a pin drop. Very emotional. Here is Pastor Jeremy Johnson, Lutheran Church of Hope. Well, on behalf of Lutheran Church of Hope, we want to welcome you and we want to thank you for coming here today as we celebrate and we honor the life of Sergeant Anthony Bominio, a beloved husband, father, son, brother, uncle, fellow officer, person in the community that helps to keep us safe. We want to thank you for being here. Thank you for being together as we come together to celebrate the hope that we have and the God who brings us that hope, the God who makes that hope something that we can place our lives into. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of all mercy and the God of all consolation. He comforts us in all of our sorrows that we can comfort others in their sorrows with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. When we were baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Would you join me in a word of prayer? O God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our brother Anthony. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage here on earth. God, in your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us your aid so that we may see in death the gate to eternal life that we may continue our course on earth in confidence until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Scripture verse that the family has chosen to, to read this morning uh, comes from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 57. Good people pass away, the godly often die before their time. But no one seems to care or wonder why. No one seems to understand that God is protecting them from the evil to come. For those who follow godly paths will rest in peace when they die. Here ends the reading. Our service will continue uh, this morning with uh, two prayers that will be read by two of uh, Tony's good family friends, followed by a eulogy that will be given by Chief Dana, Dana Wingert. the police officer's prayer to St. Michael. St. Michael, heaven's glorious commissioner of police, who once so neatly and successfully cleared God's premises of all its undesirables, look with kindly and professional eyes on your earthly force. Give us cool heads, stout hearts, and uncanny flair for investigation and wise judgment. Make us the terror of burglars, the friend of children and law-abiding citizens, kind to strangers, polite to bores, strict with lawbreakers, and impervious to temptations. You know, St. Michael, from your own experiences with the devil, that the police officer's lot on earth is not always a happy one. But your sense of duty that so pleased God, you are hard knocks that so surprised the devil, and your angelic self-control give us inspiration. And when we lay down our nightsticks, enroll us in the heavenly force, where we will be as proud to guard the throne of God as we have been to guard the city of all the people. Amen. A police officer's prayer. Lord, I ask for courage, courage to face and conquer my own fears, courage to take me where others will not go. I ask for strength, strength of body to protect others, the strength of the spirit to lead others. I ask for dedication, dedication to my job, to do it well, 
dedication to my community to keep it safe. Give me, Lord, concern for others who trust me and compassion for those who need me. And please, Lord, through it all, be by my side. Good morning, everyone. Before I get started, somebody in this church is missing a pocket Bible. I snagged it up, but I just need to borrow it for a few minutes, if you don't mind. First and foremost, on behalf of the Des Moines Police Department, I want to extend my deepest sympathies to Tony's family. Zoe, Frank, Patricia, Cameron, Haley, Max, Kylie. My heart bleeds for you. And if any one of, them, any one of us in this room could take away your pain, we would. We're all heartbroken. Secondly, I'd like to extend my deepest condolences to the Des Moines Police Department. What you've endured in the last eight months is more than any agency should have to endure. I don't even know what to say other than that none of us should be here. And I thank you. The reaction to what occurred speaks volumes of the communities we serve. The tragic news of what happened to Sergeant Tony Bominio and Officer Justin Martin transformed into, into a call for action for these communities. The outpouring of support has been overwhelming. You've been our rock during this difficult time and you've stood beside us so much that at times it's difficult to determine who's serving who. But more importantly, in my opinion, is that the silent majority has spoken loud and clear. The community has risen up and declared that what happened was horrific and unacceptable and will not be tolerated. This does not define central Iowa. This is not who we are. I would ask that you remain committed to this spirit, this mindset of continued support as we move forward. We are all in this together. This is our community. As we honor Tony, the easiest way for me to do it is describe who he was and what he meant to our organization. If God could handcraft the perfect police officer inside and out, it would look just like Tony. Command presence oozed from his pores. But his size and strength were just a small part of who he was. He was intelligent, organized, creative, and detailed. When Tony was at work, he always had the advantage. And his level of success made it readily apparent that Tony wasn't just good at this job, he was great at this job. But when we think of Tony, many of us remember something else. Tony truly cared. His compassion and kind-heartedness took his work and his personal life to a whole nother level. I'm going to share a story that speaks of Tony's character. And there's someone sitting in this room today who knows all about this story. So about seven, and eight, seven or eight years ago, there's two guys working the midnight shift. Two cops doing their thing. One of them's Tony. One of them works in small town Iowa, about 100 miles straight north of here. They're out there doing their thing, keeping the city safe. 
patrolling the streets, and one of them has to manage a horrific accident. Many of us in this room have been there. You know what I'm talking about. One of those that's burned in your memory. This officer thought he'd had enough. He'd seen enough pain, he'd seen enough tragedy in his years of service, and he was done. He was gonna turn in his badge at the end of the shift. And he made a phone call, and he called Tony. And he started telling, him, he, he, telling Tony that story and what his plans were. And Tony, being the epitome of a strategist, he waited. He waited for the perfect time. And then he chimed in with this. He said, you're not a quitter. You didn't raise a quitter. If you quit, you will regret this for the rest of your life. This is what we do. And if we don't do it, who else will do it? That was a conversation between a father and a son. And that officer eventually rose to serve as chief of police in Belmont, Iowa. Chief, picking Tony as your go-to guy is a pretty wise decision. Mom and Dad, you raised a good one. You should be proud, because we are. But Chief, you're not alone. There are other people in this church today who have benefited in similar fashion. You see, Tony didn't just cheer for the underdog, he lifted them up. If someone was struggling, he helped them out. If they stumbled, he lifted them back up, put them on their feet. It wasn't necessarily his job or his place. He did it because it needed to be done. He did it because he was Tony. There are students at Roosevelt High School who are more, fo more focused and more driven because Tony mentored them. There are crime victims in our community that saw justice served because of the work that Tony did as a detective. There are police officers in this room today who are more mature and more successful personally and professionally because Tony showed them the way. His character defined him, and our organization is stronger because his legacy of making us better lives on. When you ran into Tony, you talked about family. He was a proud husband, a proud father. Tony loves Zoe, and he loves you kids. He was quick to share all the stories, every trip, every date, every tackle, every pin, every basket every base hit, every game of punch out, every vacation. If you ran into Tony more than once during the day, you probably got to hear the same stories again. He was just that proud. Last winter, right before Cameron wrestled in the state tournament, we had that discussion four times in one day, all before lunch. I knew the names of every kid in your bracket, and I knew their record. And your dad knew you were going to beat them. Your dad is very proud. He's a proud man, proud of you kids, proud of his wife. Cameron, Haley, Max, not trying to scare you here, but there's nearly 500 people that work in our building. And every single one of them pretty much knew your every move. <laughs> Your dad loves you and he's proud of you. And we were happy to share his enthusiasm about your lives. That's what it's all about. Aside from the heartache of losing Tony, it leaves a void in our department. A big void. In the private sector, they look at things like potential when it comes to promotional opportunities. In law enforcement, we have a different standard. Potential doesn't cut it. There's too much at risk. We need demonstrate, demonstrated skill to make that move. You have to have the right people in the right spots. When, when we promoted Tony to sergeant, he had it. He had all the intangibles you needed. He had the skill. He had the leadership. 
He had all that and much more. Tony's future in the police department was not as a police sergeant. His future was at the command level. That was obvious to everyone. I know it. They know it. Tony knew it. He would never say it, but Tony knew it. Yet here we sit, left with the what ifs. For those of you who didn't work around Tony, or didn't necessarily know Tony, I want to share some perspective about what Tony was a part of. They say everyone has a breaking point, that place where they simply have had enough and they'll throw in the towel. That seems logical, but apparently not in law enforcement. I don't believe this to be true. The men and women that Tony worked with are an amazing bunch. The worst brings out their best. When tragedy strikes, they show up, step up, take care of business, even when it's one of their own. They don't complain, whine, or pout. They shoulder the load and go to work. Very few occupations require this of their employees, and it takes a special bunch to pull it off. They've been to hell and back in the last year, and they keep getting stronger. Every single one of them. Tony Bimineo is part of an invincible organization that just won't quit. They are absolutely incredible. That is what Tony represents. These are Tony's people. Zoe, we talked about this. You said you'd give me a minute. It's time for a confession. Seems like I'm in the right place for that. We've had a rough go of it lately. And a lot of people have told me, stay strong for your troops. I think I've heard that a million times. This is where I'm going to come clean. The strength of our organization isn't at the top. The fabric that makes us strong is intertwined throughout the entire organization, all ranks, sworn and civilian, from the people sitting in this front row all the way back, not to mention the people back there right now taking care of our streets, occupying our building to make sure business is taken care of. That's our strength. Our organizational chart really means nothing when you measure strength. If the rules were changed, I'd like to think that I could demonstrate the same skill and courage and resolve that you people have shown me. But I'm not sure I can. But I'm not embarrassed or ashamed to say that. In fact, I'm proud and I'm thankful to be a part of it. Maybe I don't say it enough, but whether you know it or not, you have held me up. We've got good people, and we can do this. I know we can. And even if we stumble, look around you. They're here for us. Look around this room. We got this. We can get through this. To the Zoe and the rest of Tony's family, you're all staring at me, and you're looking at me, and I know what you're thinking. What's your next move? Chief, what's your next move? What are you going to do next? Zoe, you've been around long enough. I think you know how this works. Chief, you get it. Let me tell you how this plays out. This DMP dam family will close in on you and wrap their arms around you. They will always be there for you. They will always take care of you. You will never feel lonely, helpless, or walk in fear. They know what their responsibilities are, and they will not let you down. You have my word on that. I watch this happen every day. I know these people. They will not fail you. Our home is your home. There is always a place for you at 25 East 1st Street. 
Take a look over here. This is what you get. And I'm telling you, you're lucky to have them. But there's a little more to this. When you walk out of this building, you're going to see how far family extends. Public service officials from all over the state, every corner of the country, elected officials from city, state, county, federal level, they're all here to share your sorrow. Community members, people that will help you, people that will help you shoulder the sorrow, people that have helped us shoulder the the sorrow. They are all here for you. They are all here for Tony. Through the tears when you walk out, give them a smile because their hurt is your hurt. The presence here is a symbol that no one should ever have to go through this alone. And their commitment is that no one ever will. That's why they came. It's truly something special. And the man before us deserves every bit of it. Everything Tony did, he did from the heart. Think of what a different world it would be if everybody took that same approach. I want to leave you with a passage from the book of Isaiah. It's chapter 6, verse 8. And I didn't pick this verse. In fact, I was kind of preoccupied trying to find something that would give me strength. This was given to me by one of my police officers. A police officer that Tony took under his wing and mentored. A guy that was struggling and Tony's caring act of kindness maybe saved his life, certainly changed his life, and I guarantee you saved his career. Vintage Tony. His impact lives on. But the verse reads as follows. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, Lord. Send me. God sent Sergeant Anthony Bominio. And we're all better for it. And now his time of service has ended, and God has called him home. I am absolutely heartbroken. God bless Tony Bominio. Police are always the first to get called, and we wouldn't have it any other way. As your friends, neighbors, and family members, we've always been committed to the safety of this community. That's why we've pledged to protect and serve, because everyone needs someone to count on, and everyone deserves a helping hand. It's your support that reminds us why we're here. Every day, every call, Every thank you is another opportunity for us to be there and be ready to help whenever and however we are needed. So we serve with honor, integrity, and respect, always striving to do more to help you feel safe. Your well-being is our number one concern, and that's why we're always looking out, always prepared, always nearby. Anything you need, anytime you need it. You can always count on the truth. You can always count on loyalty. You can always count on us. We're all guardians of this community, and we're always in sight.
of that song were written by Paul Simon just a few months after the assassination of President Kennedy. He was 21 years old when he wrote it. Not bad for a 21-year-old. Deep, poetic, raw, honest, transformational. He wrote those words about the sounds of silence to express his pain and his sadness and his grief. And the grief of a nation that had gone sideways and wondered what they'd do next. And so he wrote about the frustration and the sadness, the depth of it all, the sounds of silence, how people don't hear each other, how communication doesn't happen the way it should. And then at the very end, just this hint, not kneeling down to pray to the neon, new, fake, false gods. That's not going to get us anywhere. But this wonderful hint that there has to be something more, the words of the prophets written right where we live, the ancient timeless words of the prophets declaring the word of the Lord 
the word of the creator, the sovereign one, the king of all kings, the God of justice and the God of peace, the God of resurrection hope and the God of life. The words of the prophets are written right where we live, on the subway walls, where we travel, where we go, in the tenement halls, where we reside, where we live. And they echo into the sounds of silence. And ultimately, they will win. God will win. Life will win out over death. Love will win out over hatred. Justice will win out over injustice. The echoes of the timeless ancient words of a holy God. We turn to them now because nothing less will do. The Gospel of our Lord from the 14th chapter of John. Jesus said to his followers who were grieving because Jesus had just told them that he was going to be crucified, that he was going to die as a sacrifice for us. He was that kind of a person who answered the call and went into harm's way out of love for others. And we're in the midst of a room full of people who've taken that oath who are willing to put your lives on the line for the rest of us. And when you hurt, we hurt. We're with you in this. God's word for all of us who grieve and have gone sideways and wonder where we turn next. Don't let your hearts be troubled, Jesus said. Trust in God, trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home and if this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. No, we don't know, Lord Thomas, the doubter said. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I'm the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. And from now on, you do know him. And from now on, you have seen him. This is the good news, the gospel of our Lord. And nothing less will do. So, Cameron, Haley, Max, each and every family member of Tony, Chief Wingert, law enforcement officers, police officers, local and from all over the country, to a community, this community, heartbroken and grieving, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May God's grace and his peace be something that you experience today. May it touch your hearts, not only because nothing less will do, but because that is what God wants for us. And that is our hope. May God's grace and peace not just be church words, the words that bounce around the walls of this sanctuary and don't land. Open your heart and let them touch your soul. May God's grace be your experience today. May his peace, which the scriptures say, transcends all of our human understanding, sometimes in surprising ways. May God's peace be with you in a way only God can give and nothing less can do. On almost every level, I absolutely hate that we have to be here today. This isn't right and it isn't fair. We're reminded because of what has happened, the tragedy of what has happened, how difficult this is. It reminds us a little too much of how upside down this world can be, how lost we can become as a culture, and how sometimes helpless we feel to avoid tragedies just like this. To make matters even worse, we're talking about Tony today. We're talking about somebody that you heard Chief Wingert talk about was the ultimate police officer. Somebody who wasn't just good at his job, he was good at influencing others who did the same job and shared in it. We're talking about a man who uh, was incredibly good not just at putting on the uniform and wearing the blue, but it was the way he wore it 
You can ask everybody who worked alongside of him, and I've talked to a lot of you, and every single one of you says the same thing, using different words, but says the same thing. How good of a person he was, not just a police officer, how good of a human being he was. And that makes this all the more difficult. If Tony wasn't a good guy, this would still be very hard, but because it's Tony, it makes it all that much harder. Not to mention it feels like this is far too soon. It seems just like yesterday that we gathered in this sanctuary for the funeral of Susan Farrell. And then the, the outpouring of support that was felt then continues to this day. There has to be a light for this darkness. There has to be something more. Not only was Tony good at wearing blue and putting on the uniform of the Des Moines Police Department, he was also pretty good, from what I understand, at putting on some other uniforms and some other colors. The forest green and gold of Iowa City West back in the day, where he was a star wrestler like his state wrestling son, where he was an all-state class 4A captain in the Des Moines Register football team, the first lineman to ever be named a captain of the all-state team, an elite all-stater, who ended up going to Northern Iowa and then Simpson College and his coach at Simpson said if he hadn't wrecked his knee in high school, he probably would have made the NFL. This is Tony. He wasn't just good on the field and on the mat and as a police officer, apparently he was also pretty good putting on the deer hunter orange uh, and the black of a Harley Davidson rider as well. He was not just good at those things, but his ultimate gift to others was that Tony was a family man. He was a devoted husband. He was, as you heard, an incredible father. He was there whenever he could be for his kids' events. He was the kind of father that I, uh, my heart goes out to and I can relate to because if my kids are playing in any high school sports, everybody who I work with in this church knows about it and they know the details of what's going to happen. He... Uh, because he is, he was this man, Tony, who touched all of our lives one way or another, either personally or from a distance, as a fellow law enforcement or police officer. Because it was Tony, and because of the level of tragedy of what has happened, it makes it all the more difficult for us to deal with this. So what do we do? What do we do with this darkness? Where do we go? Where, where do we turn? How do we find any hope in the midst of it? We turn to the timeless and ancient words of Scripture. We turn to God's Word. We turn to a God of justice. We turn to a God of comfort. And we turn to a God of hope who points us to His life. This God of justice comes alongside of us and reminds us that He wants that for us, not just someday in heaven, but He wants that for us now. Walk humbly and seek justice, God says through His Word. This is my call for you. This is what I want my world to be that I have created. Filled with people who walk humbly like Tony did and who seek justice in all that they do. But even so, in this fallen, messed up, sinful world where none of us are perfect, and Tony wasn't perfect either. I didn't know Tony personally, but I've heard a little bit about him. He broke a friend's moped once upon a time, that I know for a fact, because he's just too big. And he cheered for the Cardinals, for crying out loud. That's just wrong on every possible level, says the guy from the north side of Chicago who's preaching to you right now and is feeling really good about the way this season ended up. So we know he was a sinner in need of a savior like all the rest of us are. We know that as a fellow human being, he made mistakes both big and small. So where do we go with that? Where's our hope? Do we get right with God and and understand that God opens the gates of heaven because we're good people, because we've done all the right things, because we've served well, because we've sought justice and walked humbly? Is that going to be enough? Scripture says something really surprising about that and ultimately really hopeful for all of us. No matter who you are or how far away you think you are from God, God is closer than you think because His grace is amazing and the life that He gives, He intends for it to last. He intends for it to go beyond what the world says is the beginning and the end of that life. 
The God who is sovereign, the God of timeless words that are recorded in Scripture, the God of justice, the God who calls us to walk humbly and serve our Lord, the God who calls us to to, to gather around him and, and feel the support of a community. And my goodness, I have to tell you, the support of the law enforcement and police community that is demonstrated here in this room today is absolutely inspiring to those of us who just are watching you kind of observing from a distance. You are doing precisely what your creator calls you to do. You aren't just sending a note or a card or saying, hey, you know, we're thinking about you and praying for you. You're showing up. You're here in this room to support somebody many of you worked alongside and loved as a, as a brother, but also to come and support somebody you, you, you hardly even knew. You, you just know of his name now and his circumstance and what happened to him. But you fill up this sanctuary, this holy place. You're sitting on holy ground and you're doing holy things. Holy is one of those big church words that has a very simple definition. It just means God sets it apart for you to do what you've been created to do. And your presence here today is hugely important. I can tell you, having been somebody who's grieved the death of loved ones, family members in my own life, that I cannot tell you, I cannot remember more than two or three words that were said at those funeral services, but I remember who was there, and I remember the support, and your presence here today is hugely important for that reason, to support this family and to support this great Des Moines Police Department that has gone through unspeakable amounts of grief and suffering over the last eight months. Thank you for being here. You're an inspiration just by your presence. And your time and your trip and your effort to get here is all well spent. It's an investment God will use to bless the people who need it the most right here. And God is in all of that. God is the one who moves and inspires us to do these things. God is love. And anything that we do as an action of love ultimately comes from this source, this God who created us and inspired us and gives us this motive inside of our hearts and souls to say, that's who you are. And so therefore, that's what you should do. We turn to God at a time such as this because nothing less will do. And God comes through. It's the most amazing part of this whole thing. I absolutely don't want to be here. I don't want us to be here. I don't want this circumstance to be something where we have to gather again. I don't want it ever to happen again. I I don't want us to become so jaded as a community that this doesn't become rare. This is Des Moines, Iowa. This is where Midwestern Nice usually wins the day. This is the kind of place where these kinds of things didn't happen before. And I pray and I hope with everything I've got that they never happen again. But we live in a fallen, messed up world where sometimes we go sideways and we don't hear each other. And people do unspeakable, horrendous things. And good people suffer because of it. So where do we go? Is justice going to be enough to make this right? I hope justice is served. God is for justice being served. God wants justice to be served. But even if justice is served in this world, this side of heaven, it doesn't bring Tony back. Best possible scenario, doesn't bring him back. So we have to turn to a God who isn't just a God of justice, but a God of comfort. A God who says this, and I want you to hear this. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, and I will give you this peace which transcends all human understanding. Come to me, for my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Come to me. God is the God of all comfort and the God of all consolation, the scriptures say. God is the God who shows up for us in the way you're showing up for each other and those who are grieving the most today by your presence here in the sanctuary. There's this story in the middle of John's gospel where Jesus is on his way to a funeral for a friend named Lazarus, a young man who died before his time. And Lazarus has two sisters, Mary and Martha, who are grieving along with the rest of the family because this young man has died by the world's standards way before his time. And so the grief has escalated like it is here today. The sorrow is deep. And this is Jesus' friend. And Jesus shows up and he does two things. And I want to leave you with this. The first thing he does is he offers comfort. He comes alongside of the sisters 
He comes alongside of the family, the loved ones, the people who are grieving, who are hurting the most. And he stands alongside of them and he weeps with them. I know, Chief Wingert, that you said something very true. That the strength of the Des Moines Police Department isn't necessarily at the top, but it's all throughout the ranks. I would just add this caveat, from the outside looking in, it's also at the top. And you standing up and saying what you said, holding back the tears, is right in alignment with the way Jesus shows up in this story. The leader of the pack shows up, and he sits down with the sisters, and he weeps. It's the shortest verse in the whole Bible. And so it's the one all our junior high confirmation students in this church want to memorize for their memory verse. <laughs> Jesus wept. Here, I'll teach you a whole entire verse from the Bible. Everyone say, Jesus wept. You just memorized a whole verse and a key verse from Scripture and a verse that I hope sticks with you. Where is God in our suffering? He's being a strong leader. He's weeping alongside of you because he knows that this world isn't what God created it to be. That in our sinfulness, we've fallen away from a God who is a God of life and a God of justice. And in that fall, in that pulling away, in our sinfulness, in our rebellion against our creator, we have this chasm, we have this, this gap between us and our creator. And in that kind of a world, bad things happen to good people, like Tony. And in that kind of a world, there's a time for weeping. There's a time for celebrating, but there's a time for weeping too. And Jesus knew it was time to weep. And so that's where God is in our sorrow. Sometimes people will say, well, where, where's God in all this? How, how come God allows something like this to happen? And that's an honest and a good question to ask. And you should ask it. And God can take it. God wants to hear your honest questions about his presence in the midst of all this. But the good news is, as he shows up, People will say, well, well, God took Tony. God didn't take Tony. Death took Tony. God takes death. I want to make sure you get that. Death took Tony. God takes death. And God takes the evil that led to Tony's death. And God takes the sin that led to the evil that led to Tony's death. And God wins a victory over all of those enemies we don't have any hope of defeating on our own. Even collectively, even all together, even at our best. Yes, we can move toward justice. And yes, we can move toward peace. And yes, we can enforce laws. And yes, we can do all these things that God calls us to do and sends us out to do. It is our calling. It is who we are. But ultimately, we live in this messed up, fallen world where sinful people do evil things that lead to death. That's what took Tony's life. But here's the good news for you today. Your God is not just a God of comfort. He's a God of hope and life. Zoe, I've got a, I've got a verse for you over here. It just absolutely blows my mind that your name is Zoe. Because over by that massive cross that's over there that one of the members of this church got from a tree in Oregon, had it shipped over here, cut it up himself with some friends, put it together, and then walked it here from Grimes into this church. That cross, we made it so big that if community events ever happen here and people come in and say, hey, could you move the cross? We're like, sure, go ahead, move it. Because that's our hope. A God who loves us so much he sent his son into this world to die for us so that anyone who believes in him will not die but will have everlasting life. This is not a promise from a preacher. This is not a wish upon a star. This is the word of God. The timeless scriptures. The hope of the universe. The one who created life and saves life and sustains life. This is the God who says, by my love and through Jesus Christ and by his death, he takes your sin and the darkness of evil and all of the death that is combined with it, takes it to the cross and puts it to death and has crucified it there. It is put to death. He had to die so those things would die. So that this isn't the end. That there is hope for a salvation that transcends the grave. Here's how Jesus sees the grave. He walks up to it in the same way Tony used to attack Iowa City high school quarterbacks. Those poor little souls. His father told me with righteous pride the other day in, in, the, in, in, a, in a room of people, say, this is the kind of person he was. He would break through the line 
in a particular game against Iowa City High, the big rivals, right? And he would plow through and in his elite all-state captain of the team way, would destroy the quarterback and win a victory for his team. Let me tell you about a champion who's come to fight for you today. He's the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the way, the truth, and the life, the resurrection and the life. We think so much of that verse in this story where Jesus showed up for this funeral for his friend Lazarus, and first he weeped and he comforted his friends as Jesus is here to comfort all of you today. All of us, this grieving, heartbroken community. It says, how can something like this happen here in our hometown? God shows up for us with his comfort, but he also shows up with his resurrection power, with his life, with a break through the line and win a victory for his team over all the enemies we can't defeat. We think so much of this verse from Scripture in this story, we engraved it in the original Greek over by that cross, which says, Ego e me, I am a Anastasis, the resurrection, kai a, here's the good part, zo. Kai a zo, your name means life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the one who overcomes the grave. Anastasis in the original Greek, which will never be changed no matter what English translation you're reading, that's the way it was inscribed the first time. I am the resurrection. Resurrection, Anastasis means and victory over death. Not just for a period of time, but for eternity, forever. I am the resurrection, I am the life, I am the Anastasis and the Zoe. I am the one who is here for you now and always will be. I am the one who comes square, face to face, with your death and says, come here, by my amazing grace, by the love of the creator of the universe, I hereby declare to you that the love of the creator is bigger than your sin and your evil and the darkness from the death. God's light is brighter than the darkness. The Bible promises this. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not have the potential to extinguish it. Never. God's light wins over the darkness. God's life wins over death. God's love wins over hatred. Don't underestimate the power of God's love. Never underestimate it. Never give up hope in the God of resurrection and life. He is a God who calls and cries out for justice. He is a God who comforts us in our sorrow. And finally and ultimately and most importantly on a day like this, he is a God who promises life everlasting for all who put their trust and faith in him. You might hear that and say, oh, that's great for religious people and church people, but the only reason I'm here today is because it's Tony. I'm not a church person, I'm not a religious person, I'm not a spiritual person, so this must not be for me. More good news for you. It's for you. God's love is for you. Look at the kind of people Jesus called to follow him. He skipped over the religious leaders like me. He knew we had our weaknesses. And he went after fishermen, regular folks, people who put on uniforms, people who weren't the most religious or the most spiritual to bring the love of our creator to the whole world. Talking about a radical savior, the resurrection and the life, the hope of the world, the one who brought that hope to Tony brings that hope to you, every single one of you, by his amazing grace, and to me, because we're all sinners in need of a savior. If you think, if this is the first time you've been in this church before, that you walked into a church that thinks that this is a hangout for saints, you don't know us very well. This is a hospital for sinners. This is where some of the most messed up people in our community hang out, starting with me. But we're living in God's amazing grace. And you could be too. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. God is a God of justice for sure. God is a God of comfort in your sorrows for sure. But ultimately God is a God of amazing grace and resurrection power and everlasting life. And so even though we hate to be here today, we don't lose hope. 
we don't lose hope because we've got a God who wins victories over the enemies we can't defeat. Amen. me 
mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Let us pray. God of all grace, amazing grace, you sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to bring life and immortality to light. We give you thanks then, even in our sorrow, because by his death, Jesus destroyed the power of death. And by his resurrection, he's opened the kingdom of heaven to all who believe. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come shall be able to separate us from your love, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our prayers continue with the singing of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, Simon Estes, uh, who's an internationally acclaimed opera star, just happens to be a part of our church family here at Hope, and I was favorite son. We try not to abuse that. We try not to ask him to sing too much because he's a busy man. He's sung for presidents and popes, kings and queens, openings of World Cup soccer tournaments, but we thought this was worthy of it. So we asked Simon to come and sing the Lord's Prayer. Let it be the prayer in your heart as you hear Simon S. to sing it to you. Our Father, which are service today continues with the commendation. The words are in your uh, insert in your bulletin. Would you please join me as we read this uh, with one another.
Please join me as we say this with one another. Into your arms, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Anthony. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Continue with the special words in the final 1042. What are policemen made of? Don't credit me with the mongrel prose that I'm about to recite because it has many parents. It has thousands of parents. Policemen. A policeman is a composite of what all men are, I guess, a mingling of saint and sinner, dust and deity, called statistics, wave the fan over stinkers, underscore instances of dishonesty and brutality because they are news. What that really means is that they are exceptional. They are unusual. They are not commonplace. Buried under the froth is the fact. And the fact is that less than one half of one percent of policemen misfit that uniform. And that is a better average than you'd find among clergymen. What is a policeman? He of all men is at once the most needed and the most wanted, a strangely nameless creature who is sir to his face and pig or worse behind his back. He must be such a diplomat that he can settle differences between individuals so that each will think he won, but if a policeman is neat, he's conceited. If he's careless, he's a bum. If he's pleasant, he's a flirt. If he's not, he's a grouch. He must make instant decisions which would require months for a lawyer, but... If he hurries, he's careless. If he is deliberate, he's lazy. He must be first to an accident, infallible with a diagnosis. He must be able to start breathing, stop bleeding, tie splints, and above all, be sure the victim goes home without a limp or expect to be sued. The police officer must know every gun, draw on the run, and hit where it doesn't hurt. He must be able to whip two men twice his size and half his age without damaging his uniform and without being brutal. If you hit him, he's a coward. If he hits you, he's a bully. A policeman must know everything and not tell. He must know where all of the sin is and not partake. The policeman from a single human hair must be able to describe the crime, the weapon, the criminal, and tell you where the criminal is hiding, but if he catches the criminal, he's lucky. If he doesn't, he's a dunce. If he gets promoted, he has political pull. If he doesn't, he's a dullard. The policeman must chase bum leads to a dead end, stake out ten nights to tag one witness who saw it happen but refuses to remember. He runs files and writes reports until his eyes ache to build a case against some felon who will get dealed out by a shameless Seamus or an honorable who isn't honorable. The policeman must be a minister, a social worker, a diplomat, a tough guy, and a gentleman. And, of course, he'll have to be a genius because he'll have to feed a family on a policeman's salary. Dispatch to 5030. Dispatch to 5030. Dispatch to 5030, Sergeant Bamineo. There is no answer from 5030. Sergeant Anthony Bamineo went 1042 for the last time on November 2nd, 2016. Sergeant Bamineo, your brothers and sisters in blue will forever watch over your family. May you rest in eternal peace. As we close our service uh, this afternoon, just a couple quick announcements. The honor guard are going to go and get into place as they will...
form a line for us to recess out of. For those of you who are going to the gravesite, for those of you who will be taking your squad cars, we would ask, the family has asked if you would drive two by two all the way out to the gravesite. For those of you who didn't, don't have a squad car, Dart Transportation will have buses that will pick you up right outside of the main church doors, and so please take advantage of that. Dart buses will bring you out to the gravesite and will also bring you back here uh, to Lutheran Church of Hope. Also, there has been a meal that is provided that you can grab on your way out to, to take with you as you can get something to eat as you go out to the, the gravesite that has been given and donated to you, so please take advantage of that. This concludes our service as we listen to the recessional song.
You are watching live continuing KCCI 8 news coverage of the funeral of Des Moines Police Sergeant Anthony Bimenio. It's been uh, going on since 11 o'clock this morning. Very moving service. Words of hope, words of reassurance. But nevertheless, the underlying feeling of what a tragedy this is. Uh, an 11 year Des Moines Police veteran shot down in the prime of his life in the early morning hours of November 2nd, last Wednesday, ambush style, and he did not have a chance. At a very emotional service today, uh, Chief Dana Winger delivered the eulogy, and uh, he began by saying, we are all heartbroken. Certainly captures the feeling of all those not only in the room, but throughout our central Iowa community and throughout the law enforcement community all across the country. Chief Wingert said to his team from the Des Moines Police Department, what you have endured in the last eight months is more than any agency should have to endure. What he is referring to, to is that the death of Sergeant Bominio is the third line of duty death for his department in this past year, this past eight months. Uh, eight months ago, two of his police officers, Officer Carlos Puente Morales and Officer Susan Farrell were killed when the vehicle they were riding in was hit by a wrong way driver on Interstate 80. Chief Winger went on to say that the public has stood up so completely following the deaths of Officer Vominio and Justin Martin of Urbandale who was also involved in this horrible, horrible incident that uh, Chief Wingard's not sure who was serving whom here. He says that the community has determined that this will not be tolerated. We are all in this together. It is our community, his words. He also said about Officer Anthony Bominio, if God could have designed the perfect police officer, it was Tony. And the number one reason for that is because Tony cared. Also went on to relay a story that happened about seven or eight years ago. Two officers working the overnight shift and uh, one called the other after witnessing and dealing with a horrible, horrible automobile crash and he couldn't deal, it with, deal with it anymore. Everything that uh, he'd seen on the job and his time as a police officer, he'd had enough and he called Tony Bominio and he told him what he was going to do, that he was going to quit. And Tony said, we don't do that. We're not quitters. This is what we do. And the person on the other end of the line was his father, who is now the police chief in Belmond, Iowa. And he did not quit that day. And he continued. And Chief Winger used that as an example of the impact that Tony Babinio had on the Des Moines Police Department and the offers with officers within it. He was a leader. He was somebody others came to for advice. He was someone who offered advice, who picked up people when they were down, who took officers who may have been struggling and helped them become better police officers. People who are still on the force today, people who are still serving us in the city of Des Moines. And not only just his fellow officers, but also the school children he worked with day in and day out as he was taking his tour as a school resource officer in uh, Des Moines schools. We want to go outside now, outside of Lutheran Church of Hope. Molly Cooney and Alex Sachs are there to capture some of the emotion in the scene that's happening outside the sanctuary today. Molly? Thank you very much. It has been extremely emotional and as we are here waiting for everyone to file out of the service, people are starting to line up along the stretch here. If you can take a look, there's a sign. One man has a sign over here that says, Fallen, Not Forgotten. And it's a sign for both officers. It has both of their badge numbers on it, and if you can see along this stretch, people are holding American flags, parents are holding their children. Uh, people have been lined up here since 11, uh, and the crowd has only gotten bigger 
as the service continued. There's a large crowd of people on the other side of the street, and it is just ongoing. It's impossible for us to capture all of it for you in this moment, but it is all the way down the enormous flag that flies over the intersection here of Jordan Creek Parkway and Ashworth is overwhelming, a very powerful image. A lot of people just standing in awe of that huge flag, what it symbolizes here today, and the tribute to Sergeant Tony Bominio. And as we mentioned, um, police officers, law enforcement from East Coast, West Coast, Texas, all the surrounding states of Iowa, and then I would think almost every department within the state of Iowa has sent a squad car or a representative. And uh, Chief Winger today did say during the service, the reason that the law enforcement comes, quote, no one should have to go through this alone. And that's why they come. He thanked them. He thanked everyone for their time out of their busy service. He also thanked the people that are filling in for them as they are coming here today to pay their respects to this fallen officer. And he admitted this time has been difficult for him and his entire team at the Des Moines Police Department. He knows that law enforcement across the country has, this has been a difficult time for anyone serving under that badge, but he says it's been difficult to determine who's serving who. Mm -hmm. And that was a testament to how this community has come forward to show them the love and support in a time like this. He said the silent majority has spoken up loud and clear and this is, they're not going to tolerate this in our community. And that type of language was, was shared by several people who spoke during the service, the, the community coming together and what that meant for Tony. And really, that's what Sergeant Bimenio himself represented, Absolutely. being there for the man next to him, the woman next to him. If children at the high school needed him, he was there in a big way, in a huge presence. They talked about his impact. And if our photographer could bring the camera over, we have to show you this. I don't know if oh, this is children. a school. This is a very large group of children that have just started to file in across the street. Some of them holding signs. Um, they're guided by maybe teachers or a group of, what a powerful image to see even children of, the, of that age here to watch the procession uh, this morning, in the early afternoon. And Chief Wingert also talked directly to Sergeant Bimineo's family. He said to his parents, Frank and Patricia Bimineo, you raised a good one. He also looked at the immediate family, the surviving wife and the three children. Chief Wingert said, this Des Moines Police Department family will always take care of you. He said, they will not let you down. Our home is your home. You are lucky to have them. And his voice broke quite a bit. The readers, it was obviously very emotional. Very emotional. In fact, Dana Winger ended his, his eulogy with, quote, I am absolutely heartbroken. God bless Tony Bimineo. There was a lot of personal uh, sentiment involved. Some, there was a little bit of laughter as they mm -hmm. were remembering Tony, mm -hmm. his love for the St. Louis Cardinals, mm -hmm. um, the Iowa Hawkeyes, and watching his children play sports. He could not have been more proud of his family, his wife Zoe, mm -hmm. and their children. And that was definitely clear in that eulogy and throughout the ceremony. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of the service, to just talk about how many people are here today to mm -hmm. show support and to be here. It, it, it took several minutes for every law enforcement personnel yes. to come through and give that final salute to, to Tar Sergeant Bimineo. It took minutes and you could see it right there. The different agencies represented some, some gave them the final salute right as they walked by. We are going to be here as the procession leaves the church. And as you heard Steve and Stacy say that the public is invited, there will be no cars at the um, actual gravesite as far as public cars. People are leaving here from the uh, church on buses, but the procession will come up Jordan Creek here and then it will proceed on to Interstate 235 and down to the um, cemetery. And we will continue to follow the progression as it makes its way and as people now are lining the street to solidly. Let's throw it back to you.
All right, Molly and Alex, thank you. It's, it's amazing to see the outpouring of support even today with the school children coming down to line the processional and so many other people who are just so touched by this story. Uh, we do understand that there will be more than a thousand law enforcement vehicles making the trip from Lutheran Church of Hope to Glendale Cemetery in Des Moines, and uh, we are going to be following that route. That's right. Uh, please uh, be advised that if you are out on I-235 or in the area of uh, 63rd Street over to University, these cars are going to be traveling two by two, these police cars, and there's, uh, if you uh, want to go to the graveside service, it's going to be difficult to get in there. There's not a whole lot of room for cars to park in Glendale Cemetery, but uh, nevertheless, there it is right there. Um, the funeral procession route for Sergeant Buminio, it will go uh, from Lutheran Church of Hope North on Jordan Creek Parkway, and then east on I-80 to I-235, and then from 63rd Street North to University Avenue, and then east on University to Glendale Cemetery. Our Marcus McIntosh is live along the uh, funeral procession route. He's at 50th and I-235, and uh, Marcus, what do you see? Steve, we, Steve says we see a lot going on here. We see a lot of people here. We see fire trucks here from Delaware Township and from Granger. And you can see down to the side of me, there are a lot of people here lining the route. Those are the fire trucks right there. People have lined this route on 50th Street at I-235. They are waiting patiently for the funeral procession to pass by. Now, this is on the westbound lanes. As we go down this way, you can see people down the east, on the eastbound lanes as well down this way. They are all lined up. They're waiting to see what's going on here. They, people have come here. They've lined up. They've come here. You know, people might not know each other when they got here, but people are making friends. They're talking to each other. They're sharing stories. They're saying that this is something they had to do. They had to be here to show their support for the fallen police officer, Sergeant Flaminio. They say, you know, at a time like this, it's good that people can get out and show their support. But they also say that, you know, we need to show our support for police officers on a daily basis, not just when there's a tragedy. They're, you can show it to them every day when you see them, to say hello, to talk to them, to show your support, to show your love, to show your compassion. And that's why you see all these people here. You see people standing in front of American flags, people with American flags. You see young babies here. You see people here, they're just patiently waiting for the procession to come through. You believe it's gonna come through here maybe five or 10 minutes or so, but people, when they talk to me about this, they say, they talk about the tragedy. They talk about the respect they have for police. They say this is important. They had to be here to show police just how much they respected them, just how much they support them. And a lot of people have made the mention to me, as I said moments ago, that this is something they're going to start to do on a daily basis, not in the face of tragedy, not in the face of something bad happening, but they want police every day to know that they support them, they believe in them, because every day they say police put their lives on the line to protect and serve their community, the public, and the people of their city. So we're waiting here patiently for the procession to come through. It's going to come down the, the right-hand lanes, of, I'm sorry, the eastbound lanes right here. They're going to come two by two. We're expecting them in maybe five or ten minutes. I see a lot of lights in the distance, but I can't really tell what it is at this point. As it gets closer, we will be able to determine exactly what those lights are. Lots of car lights on, lots of cars headed this way. And I can't tell if that is the start of the procession at this point, but I do not think the procession has made it on to I-80 toward 235 yet. So we're patiently waiting. We are going to be here throughout to be to get the processional for you. And when it comes down here, we will get back on and let you know about that. In the meantime, let's go back to Steve and Stacy in the studio. I'm Marcus McIntosh, live at West Des Moines. All right, Marcus, thank you very much. Uh, I do want to let you know that uh, the Des Moines Police Department getting help from other area police departments to help cover the city so as many Des Moines officers could go to Sergeant Pominio's service as possible. Pleasant Hill Police Department, uh, the Des Moines Police Department would like to thank them. They're covering the east side of the, city, of the city. And then Windsor Heights and West Des Moines are helping the Des Moines Police Department on the west side of the city. And again, here is the map of the funeral procession if you would like to try to find your way to it. Uh, it will go from the church, uh, Lutheran Church of Hope North on Jordan Creek Parkway, then east on Interstate 80 and to I-235. From there, the 63rd Street exit to north on University. And finally, the procession leads to Sergeant Mominio's final resting place at Glendale Cemetery. And that's where we check in with KCCI's Mark Tauschek, live at Glendale. Yeah, Stacy, we want to give you a 
idea here of Sergeant Biminio's final resting place here at Glendale. It is a area that a lot of people are going to be familiar with. Glendale is right along University and certainly everyone is familiar in the Des Moines metro area with the pond right here along University at Glendale. Always a lot of waterfall here, a lot of people stop and feed the ducks and the geese. So if you look a little bit to the left of that pond, not maybe 50, 60 yards from University Avenue, you can see where Sergeant Biminio will be laid to rest this afternoon. Now we want to let people know that private vehicles are not being allowed inside the cemetery because of all the parking limitations. We have the Patriot Guard who's going to drive in here on their motorcycles. We are going to have the long procession that is going to wind through Glendale Cemetery. We're expecting two to three hundred vehicles according to Sergeant Paul Parizek holding 1,000 officers. University Avenue here, just a traffic note for everyone, will be shut down during the procession and during the funeral itself. There will be a 21 gun salute with an honor guard, a bugler will pay, play taps, and there will also be a riderless horse that is going to be leading the procession in. A riderless horse commemorating and signifying someone who's been lost traditionally in battle, but police officers use it a lot as well to remember someone who's fallen in the line of duty. Stacy and Steve, back to you. Very powerful images throughout the afternoon. Thank you, Mark Tauschek. We want to remind you that tomorrow we will be bringing you live coverage of services for Urbandale officer Justin Martin. His services are expected to begin at 1140 a.m. 1140 is his badge number, so his family chose that to be the start of his funeral and his services are being held in Rockwell City. So we will be covering more tragedy tomorrow here on KCCI 8 News. We will cover Officer Martin's funeral services just like we did today. Uh, continuous live, co live coverage online and on air. So KCCI.com or Channel 8.1. We thank you for joining us today. Unfortunately, uh, we spent a lot of time with you today thinking about tragedy. Let's uh, try to keep a positive thought for Officer Bimenio's family and Officer Martin's family. And we will see you on the news at 5, 6, 9, and 10 tonight. Thank you for joining us today.